Well, hello, everyone. This really surprised me in a way. Um, I was just going to have this be a, a blog, but then the more I studied it, the more I realized that the Bible has a lot to say about this topic. Stumbling blocks surprised me in a way. Stumbling blocks and how we shouldn't be putting stumbling blocks up in front of the brethren. And I knew I needed to study it for myself. I knew that I have in the past. I think all of us have in the past put stumbling blocks at one time or another in front of people without maybe even knowing it at different times. So we know God teaches us to accept and love, help and encourage one another. But sometimes, maybe even carelessly not realizing it, we do the opposite. Without even knowing it sometimes, we can be setting out stumbling blocks to our brothers and sisters. And the point of this sermon is to help us be more aware of it. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of Light on the Rock. Uh, you can uh, also print the notes to this, follow along with that, or you can also um, make comments on, on, the, on the sermon as well. So anyway, we can be setting out stumbling blocks to our brothers and sisters and not even be aware of it. So it's time to have a sermon on it. I preach to myself in this sermon because I think we've all done this in our actions, in our inactions, the things we say in our anger and our impatience, or even deliberately or not realizing it, we have at times done things not pleasing to God involving our brethren. So I'm Philip Shields, and our focus on this site is the relationship between us and fellow man, and of course primarily between us and God, and the Son of God, and stumbling blocks has a lot to do with the topic of loving one another as we love God, as we love one another. God's very, very clear, as you'll soon see. He gets very upset when we place any kind of stumbling block in front of anyone, especially his children of his family. By children, I mean we're all God's children <clears throat> in his family when we have God's spirit. A stumbling block is something we do or don't do that can cause a brother or sister to falter, to fall, to be tempted, to go from there into actual sin, because temptation is not the sin, but giving too much time on the temptation to where it becomes wrong thoughts and all that, that can be sin. Or it can cause them to quit their relationship with God altogether. So in this blog, I'll set up a few examples. Um... So the purpose of this blog is to make each of us much more aware of that. I need you to also be aware that God and his son have themselves been a cause of stumbling. Not that they put out a stumbling block, but I don't, I'm not talking about that use of the word stumbling. That Christ became a stumbling block to the Jews who would not accept him as their Messiah. Romans 9 Verses 32 to 33, that's not the kind of stumbling block I'm referring to here. So let's go back to the kind of stumbling blocks that we are. In other words, Yeshua, Jesus, was never a stumbling block because of his sin or because he tried to make people sin. Not at all. Or inadvertently made people sin. But they did refuse him as their Messiah. But now if we lay down a stumbling block, we're committing a very deep sin. We're saved by grace not works. I know that. We're rewarded by the things we do, by our works. So works are very important. One of these days I'll give a sermon on how important works are. It doesn't save us, but works are things that do have a big impact on our eternity. So reward is not salvation, but putting out stumbling blocks can cause some very terrible consequences to us, as you'll see. Romans 19.14 Oh, Romans, it says here, that should not be Romans, that should be Leviticus. Leviticus 19.14, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear the Lord your God. I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. Some people sometimes place offenses, literally, maybe as a joke in front of someone blind. That's what a horrible joke that would be. But I think spiritually, we put out spiritual stumbling blocks to those who can't see the, properly, are spiritually blind. God doesn't like that. It'll be, this sermon, the points will, be, will get clearer and clearer as we go along. 
Romans 14, verses 12 uh, to 13. So there it says, Then each of you shall give account to God. Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Isn't that something? Not to cause anybody to stumble or fall. Here's what Jesus himself said. So are you getting the point? If there's something you're doing, whether you think it's important or not, that's causing someone else to stumble or fall, that's a stumbling block. It can cause them to sin. Now Matthew 18, verses 6 and 7. Whoever causes, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. His context there was talking about little children becoming as little children. So especially if we do any things, anything that upsets the kids, makes them be turned off of God, off of religion, God's religion, makes them leave the church, it's very, very serious in God's eyes. Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses must come, verse 7, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. So when you see that you've caused offense to anyone, it should lead us to repentance. It's pretty serious. Now, I'd rather today be speaking about God's favor or grace, about his love or powerful faith, but there's enough in the Bible about this thing of offenses and stumbling blocks that I thought we should talk about it. What are some examples of stumbling blocks that we may be putting out there? <clears throat> Anytime we cause someone else to sin is a stumbling block. We may not know we're doing it. That's part of the reason for this sermon is to wake us all up to pray that God will reveal to us where we're doing that. So I'll give some examples. For example, you know someone tells you he really shouldn't be drinking alcohol, that he has a weakness there, and he might end up drinking too much. And you're out at someone's house or out of the restaurant. Oh, come on, you can have one, one glass of wine. It's not going to hurt you. You can, you can stop yourself on one glass. Well, if he's told you, you become aware the man's alcoholic or inclined to be, that is putting out a stumbling block. But remember, the very first miracle that Jesus did was turning water into the very best wine possible that could not have been just grape juice. The governor of the wedding party was just amazed how good it was. They, I don't think would ever say that about grape juice. But anyway, some people should try not to drink any alcohol at any time. So urging someone, hey, come on, you can, have, uh, you can handle one drink. It's not going to hurt you that bad. But that action may lead him to go home and later on drink until he's drunk. And who knows what will happen? Who knows if he'll continue drinking right in your presence and go home drunk, maybe cause an accident or get arrested and sin because we urged him that we believed he could handle one drink. That's a stumbling block. Anytime you urge something that is not a sin in itself but something that person shouldn't be doing, is a stumbling block. Another example is flirting. Flirting with someone's wife, or really anyone, whom you sense, especially if you sense they might have a sexual weakness, or that person likes to flirt as well, and they're coming back on to you, or you may sense they even kind of like you. Many men and women are flirts. Please admit it, maybe you have been one of them. In my past, yeah, I've had to overcome and resist that too. Flirting can often lead to sex sin, at least in the mind, if not actual acts. Saying something about, uh, saying something that, that's a double entendre, you know, a, a, a double meaning. Um, you flirts out there know what I'm talking about. We have to repent of it and stop. Balaam in the Bible, you can read the story in Numbers 25, used this to be the means 
to place a huge stumbling block in front of Israel. In Revelation 2 and 3, we have the messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor, now Turkey. Notice what's said about Pergamos. I believe it's the third church. Revelation 2.14 I have a few things against you because you have those among you who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, the king of uh, either Midian or Moab, to put a stumbling block stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So what Balaam did was he taught Balak that, hey, I can't myself curse Israel, but you can do things that will cause them to be cursed by God. So hey, combine idol worship and send down some of your scantily clad pretty young women. Maybe even tell the Israelites that, hey, the sexual acts they do uh, as they worship their God is to have, uh, the things they do is to have some sexual acts accompanying the worship of their gods, what I'm trying to say. And you're sure to get them doing things that's going to anger their God. And sure enough, that's what happened. You can read the story in Numbers 25. And yes, this caused the death of many, many thousands by putting the stumbling block, in this case combining, idolatry with sexual immorality. A very tough thing for many men to resist. So ladies of God, some women, even church women, dress in such a provocative way that can entice men to look them over from head to toe with lustful thoughts. That's placing stumbling blocks. Men, Nothing anyone does can justify us sinning. We can turn our heads. We can refuse to look. We can contr control our thoughts. But women, why make it difficult? A godly woman would not want that to happen, so would dress modestly. If Peter and Paul could discuss it, I can too. First Peter 3, verses 3 to 6 says, God's women are not the focus of on outward apparel, but to focus on having beautiful insides, to have a gorgeous heart, which God prizes. First Peter 3, 3 to 6. First Timothy 2, verses 8 to 10. I desire that the men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands. That's why you'll often see me as I pray with my hands up. Uh, it's, I have a sermon on lifting holy hands. If you haven't heard that, I hope you will, because it's a false doctrine out there that it's wrong to lift hands. I mean, what, a, what a false doctrine. Solomon did, uh, Moses did, David many times did, Paul certainly did, and taught it. Right here, First Timothy 2, verse 8. I desire men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. <clears throat> In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation. Modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with fancy hairdos, braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. It's not saying it's wrong to have a hairdo. He's saying don't make that your focus. And expensive clothing and have the latest brand and all that. But, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Adorn yourself with modest apparel. Modest apparel. I hope you hear that. So, n examples of immodesty would be to wear a blouse or a top that shows cleavage. Maybe more than just a half inch or so. But it shows cleavage. It makes men's eyes just go straight there. Straight there. And you know it. You, you see where they're looking. And it just makes it difficult for us. A skirt, a dress, or shorts that are so short that men everywhere are looking you over. And maybe some of you want that. Check your heart. That's something I'm saying needs to be awakened in you to stop that. Because it's causing, it's causing work to resist a big fight in the men's hearts. Sure, the men should be able to look elsewhere, resist temptation, but why tempt them? 
But man, again, listen, regardless of what women may do or don't do, it gives us no excuse to let our minds lust. It's just, it gives no excuse. Or women, when you have company over, if you're wearing shorts that are real short or short mini skirts, so when you sit down, cross your legs, it draws the attention of every man and boy in the room. Maybe you want that. Wanting that is wrong, is something to repent of. And men, if that happens, just don't look at the person. As much as you can avoid looking, just don't look. So that's what I'm talking about. Or when you go to the beach. Nowadays you go to the beach, and I, we just, we've been to the beach once this year. We live in Florida. I think we might have gone once last year. But some outfits look like they've been made out of uh, Band-Aid and dental floss. They're so, so small. I guarantee you that becomes a stumbling block to a host of boys and men of all ages. And I suppose men could dress in a provocative way too. It's mostly women here. Women, help us out. Help the men out. Don't cause stumbling blocks. Don't cause potential wrong thoughts. Certainly not at church, certainly not at the beach, certainly not anywhere. Am I saying you got to go in a full dress at a beach? No, I'm not saying that. But don't be as skimpy as what others are wearing. And I doubt other ministers are speaking on this topic much, but Paul and Peter did, so I will too. Placing stumbling blocks may even include urging God's family to do something that's okay for you, but would hurt their conscience. Therefore, would be a sin for them, because Romans fourteen twenty seven says, "Whatever is not of faith, in good conscience, is a sin." Which my voice, my voice is going here. Sorry about that. But everything we do must be with good conscience and good faith. So Romans says, even if something is lawful, if it's going to offend others, don't do it. So Paul speaks a lot about causing stumbling blocks with food and drink. You may want to read all of Romans 14 yourself, even Romans 12. But let's talk about it. He addressed meat that had been previously offered to idols. Not an issue for us today, but my point in using this example is that Paul clearly explains that something may be okay for some, but not all right for others. Remember, for some, the idol was nothing, so they could eat the meat and wouldn't bother them. For others, it was a painful conscience-breaking thing that, man alive, I'm participating in the worship of this idol and this church member is helping me do it. So he says here, Romans 8, verses 9 to 13. Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. It's not Romans 8. Um, I don't know how that got in my notes that way. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll read what I have here, then I'll, I'll clarify. I'll clarify the word I'm looking for. It's 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 9 to 13. Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who has knowledge of eating in an idol's temple, won't their conscience of him who's weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because your knowledge, because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom, for whom God, for whom Christ died? But when you shall sin against your brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. If food or meat or drinking, there's another place where he says, I won't drink or eat meat. So look again at verse 12. Causing a brother to sin is sinning against Jesus Christ himself, for they are part of his body. And Romans 14, 8 says, we each belong to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we need to be ultra careful not to cause offenses. So yes, I'm preaching to myself here too. But I do suggest you study Romans 14 very carefully. We'll read from it some more here in a minute. 
it addresses this topic of stumbling blocks a lot. So I couldn't just leave it to a blog. In Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, Paul reminds us of this. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many, Romans 12, 5, are one body in Christ. Boy, do we not act like that too many times. We are one body in Christ. Individually, we are members, members of one another. <clears throat> So when we hurt someone, we're really hurting ourselves and we're attacking Christ. We're attacking Christ. So even if, you, even if you know, for example, that drinking wine or beer is okay, but you're at someone's house who was taught all their lives that it's wrong for a Christian to ever drink any beer or wine, don't offer it. Don't offer an alcohol in the presence of someone who would think you're sinning. Don't drink it in the presence of someone who would think you're sinning. And certainly don't do it in front of an alcoholic who may want that very badly, but shouldn't be tempted to it. Just do without. Romans 14, 21. Romans 14, 21, the uh, complete Jewish Bible. What is good is not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. That's a verse that I really want you remembering from this sermon. Don't do anything that causes a fellow brother or sister to stumble. And in the end, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the kingdom of God is not, is not in eating and drinking, Romans 14, 17. It's not about what, what you eat or drink, but we should consider other people's feelings and not be making a big deal about these things. <clears throat> Romans 14, 12 to 13. I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible. So then every one of us will have to give an account of himself to God. Therefore, stop passing judgment on each other. Instead, make this one judgment. Not to put a stumbling block or a snare in your brother's way. Not to put a snare, a trap, a stumbling block. Don't offend someone. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 to 33, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, what, Do everything to God's glory. Give no offense to the Jews or the Greeks or the Church of God, or the Church of God, just as I also try to please I try to please all people. Sometimes you can't, but try to. In all things. Remember he said another place, I, to a Greek, I became a Greek, to the Jew, I became a Jew. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. That's such a great verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33. I wish we could all do what Paul says there. Can with people here, they're sensitive about this issue or that issue, so I'll try not to offend. Or if they want me to get up and dance with them during services and worship, as they call it, worship. Maybe you've never done that before, but because you want to please them and you know it's not a sin to, certainly Miriam led the ladies in dancing after they crossed the Red Sea. Yeah, you can get up. You can get up if you, you know, wanted to do so. Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 10, no, Romans 14, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, are two very good chapters to read, to learn more about not causing offenses. Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 10. You might want to add Romans 12. So take this opportunity on your knees to ask God to show you where you may be causing others to stumble and not even aware of it. I'm praying that prayer too, for myself. Causing others to stumble is evidence we need to grow much more in love for that person and to God himself. Causing stumbling blocks shows there are areas of our lives where we are not walking in the light of God. 
I've had to repent of that many times. I've caused offenses in my 69 years. 1 John 2, verses 9 and 10. 1 John 2, verses 9 and 10. If anyone claims I'm living in the light, but doesn't like, hates a Christian brother or sister, that person's actually still living in darkness. 1 John 2, verse 9 and 10. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. When you're living God's way really correctly, you're not causing offense. If we're causing offense, we're doing something wrong most of the time. There are times we have to speak up, speak up for Christ, speak up for the truth. And it may offend some people to say we're against abortion, to say we're against critical race theory, the way it's being taught, canceling history, the way it's being taught. There are times to speak up, but we should try to do it in a way that's firm but not offensive, not screaming and hollering and using dirty words and bad words. So anyway, there it is, live in such a way in the light that doesn't cause offense, doesn't cause others to stumble. All of us can get better at that, all of us, including me. We can do it certainly by our words. We can cause offense by our words, how we talk to others, what we say. Pray God opens your heart and mine, mine too, to see areas of the, our lives where we're being careless on this point. Frankly, one of the scariest verses in the Bible to me is James uh, 3, verse 1. James 3, verse 1, where it urges us to be careful about wanting to be a teacher, for we'll be judged more strictly. We'll be judged more strictly. I hope you get that. Those of you who, I know some of you uh, come to my website who are preachers, you're going to be judged more strictly because we're supposed to know better. So yes, I have to be careful. I have to repent from time to time of saying or doing things that caused occasions of stumbling. And if I can admit it, I'm hoping you can as well. There's other ways that we cause offenses. Weaponizing marital sex. Weaponizing marital sex. I talked about this in the sermon I gave about keeping the Sabbath. Don't withhold marital sex from one another except for prayer and fasting. There should not be any longer than, uh, there should not be any longer our brethren saying, you have to sleep on the couch tonight. Or because of what you've done, we're not having sex for a while. Wrong, 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 brethren. Work it out. Don't go to bed angry. Sometimes I've said to people, don't go to bed angry. No, don't let not the sun go down on your wrath. Stay up and fight. No, don't stay up and fight. Stay up and work it out. Stay up and work it out. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 6, using the Holman translation, the Holman Bible, about the things you wrote, quotes, he quotes their letter, it's, a, it's good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Paul says, yeah, but you know what? Because of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. Equally, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another. He's talking sexually here. That's the whole context. Do not deprive one another. Many men need to have this twice a week, three times a week. Some women do. The other party may not feel like it. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you or your spouse. I'll just add that. Satan may tempt the one who wants some relationship going on here and it's not happening. Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now nothing justifies a man or a woman feeling they need it so badly that they have to go commit adultery. Nothing justifies that. But do notice that depriving one another of marital love can make it far easier for Satan 
to tempt you to sin. Withholding marital sex from your spouse can cause him or her to be tempted to give in to the temptation brought on by Satan, knowing you're susceptible. So you, he tempts you to go into the full sin. So withholding this in your marriage, some of you are doing it. Some of you have told me you're doing it. Is a stumbling block you're putting down in front of a child of God. It could be your husband, it could be your wife I'm talking about. I wonder how many adulteries have happened because of the fact that one partner just refuses to make love as often as the other one needs it. I'm speaking plainly, but so was Paul. Paul pretty much says the same thing, doesn't he? So don't weaponize marital sex. That's so bad. Another way we are lured into just it's, it's, in, into, into sin and to lure it into just plain giving up on God, on the church, on God's people, leaving the body of Christ permanently, is when perhaps you've been asked to leave the fellowship for whatever reason, but then you're never welcome back. The church doesn't forgive someone sometimes because maybe they feel there's been a major stumbling block for the unforgiven one. It can lead that person to just give up. Some it may lead them to suicide. I realize nowadays there are lots of congregations, but still, if someone really needs that forgiveness, it can be critical. Keeping certain people out permanently, out of their, your fellowship, out of that particular body of Christ, it's just wrong. Second Corinthians 2 discusses this. There had been a man, 1 Corinthians 5, who had been thrown out of the church for sexual immorality. By the time Paul got around to writing 2 Corinthians, the man was still outside the fellowship and was not being welcomed back, though he had repented and ceased his behavior, his bad behavior. Part of the problem is that some ministers decide for themselves whether or not they feel you've repented or not, or repented enough or not. Remember, Jesus says his own offense against you, sins against you, he said, seven times in a day. And seven times in that day comes back and says, I'm sorry, I repent. Please forgive me. You must forgive him. Because you see, that's what God does to us. Have each of us not come to God over and over many times for a sin that we just keep committing, whether it's impatience, whether it's, you know, these kinds of sins, covetousness, lustfulness, lust, uh, and uh, excessive anger. Maybe not telling the entire complete truth. Um, being weak on the Sabbath keeping. You know, sure. These are things that we do have to keep coming back to God for. <clears throat> People say that you only repented when you quit doing something. They're not being realistic. We all continue to sin from time to time of various things. Yeah, sure, it's easy to stop putting up Christmas trees or Sunday worship or eating crab. That's the easy one. Those are easy ones. But it's the spiritual things. It's the spiritual things. Covetousness and so on. Anyway, Paul here is urging, going to urge the Corinthian church to welcome this guy back. A man that God has forgiven. To welcome him back with love. Lest he be overcome with too much sorrow. Out of the NIV, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 11. NIV, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 11. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority there is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive him, comfort him, so he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, reaffirm your love for him. And he says, I wanted to see if you're going to be obedient to me. Verse 9 and 10. I've already forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Verse 10. In order, verse 11, that Satan might not outwit us. We are not unaware of his schemes, of his devices. He's saying right now, every day you let him stay outside your church, you're actually playing into Satan's hand. Bring him back in. Love him. Forgive him. Reaffirm your love. Verse 8 there. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 8. So you see how serious this can be. 
The same principle can be applied to members of your own physical family. Maybe some of your relatives have just been cast out by others because of something someone claimed they did or said. If there's been any change at all, and that person wants to be accepted in the family, you do your part. Bring them back. Be a reconciler. Be an encourager. Be a person bringing people together. Not a person splitting people apart and putting stumbling blocks out. Be a gatherer, not a scatterer. Jesus said that. That he wants us to be gathering people, not scattering. Live a life of forgiving others, accepting others. None of us is perfect. Don't give place for the devil to have an, an advantage over anybody. Remember, Satan means adver adversary. He's our enemy. Let's not give him anything to, that he can work with against us. Don't let the enemy have bad thoughts in our heads about other children of God or even family members. So finally, a whole sermon can go on that last thing I'm talking about, our words the things we say out loud or to others or in texts or social media or in gossip, these can become horrible stumbling blocks. Your words, my words, are probably the biggest stumbling blocks we use. This one point can be an entire sermon. We all need to learn to pause, think first before we speak, especially when we're upset. We type A personalities can just charge on in. I know I can. Slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to wrath, especially if you're feeling anger. Look at James 1, verse 19 and 20. James 1, verses 19 and 20. I'll read out of the International Standard Version. You must understand this, my dear brothers. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to speak, slow to get angry, slow to get angry. I got to work on that myself. For human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So I just hope this teaching today will lead us all to go on our knees and ask God to reveal to us where we're causing offense, setting stumbling blocks out that we may not even be aware that we're doing. There are many more areas I could discuss. Doctrinal beliefs is a major stumbling block for some. We just, and I have to, just get so strong that this is right doctrine, this is wrong doctrine, and as a teacher, I've got to teach the right doctrine and teach it strongly, but not in a way I hope offensive. Anyway, so whether it's the way we eat and drink around each other, or how modest or immodest our attire is, or how we talk about things or withholding marital love from each other, or keeping someone permanently out of our fellowship, so many other things could be mentioned. Let's be aware of stumbling blocks. The goal is for the bride of Christ to come together in harmony and love as soon as we can. So as one body, we can meet the Christ returning in the clouds of heaven and meet him in faith, in love, as one body. 1 John 2, verses 9 and 10. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates someone, no, he's not. He's still in darkness. Verse 10, 1 John 2, 10. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. Does not cause others to stumble. Don't do anything to cause your brother to stumble. Romans 14, 21. And uh, so try to please everybody as much as you can within God's law. Anyway, thank you very much. Father in heaven, we just come before you and just ask your dismissal. Father, I pray that people everywhere will find that this sermon, though perhaps not the most important sermon in the world, and certainly not one being preached a lot, that we will heed it, not cause other people to stumble or get offended by things we do and say or don't do and don't say. Help us to live in love. Help us to accept our, one another as ourselves, to love them as ourselves, to, and to love you, because these are part of your body, Jesus. These are part of your body. So we thank you and we praise you. We ask your dismissal and protection in these dangerous times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.